Hello, my name is Dylan Jones, Subject Officer for GCSE History. I'm going to provide you with an overview of the new EDUCAS specification for first teaching in September 2016. EDUCAS is the new brand from WJC. It provides uh, off-call regulated reformed GCSEs and other qualifications. Uh, for those of you who are unaware of the EDUCAS brand, it's simply a, a vehicle for distinguishing clearly between qualifications for Wales and qualifications for England. So I'll be talking you through the EDUCAS qualification for GCSE history, accredited by Ofqual. Uh, one of the key questions is why uh, should teachers choose the EDUCAS qualification for history? We think there are many qualities to this qualification. The first thing that I'd like to talk about is clarity of assessment. We think that the SAMs that we've developed for the qualification are extremely clear. We also think that they are accessible to all students. Uh, in developing the SAMs, we've been at pains to make sure that all students, regardless of ability, can access the questions and access the papers. We have high quality examination materials. We have a very, very strong track record of producing high quality examination materials. And we also produce uh, extremely comprehensive teaching resources. In terms of teachability, in terms of teaching, in terms of pedagogy, we think that our qualification provides a great deal of stretch and challenge. The off-call accreditation process is extremely rigorous and as a result of that there's no question that the assessment materials that we've produced will stretch and challenge uh, your students. We also feel that by studying the EDUCAS specification your students will get a very broad and very, very uh, rich grounding in the subject. We think that the specification builds very successfully on Key Stage 3, and we also feel very strongly that it prepares students uh, for the next step, which is A-level. We run excellent professional development courses. All of our courses are led by principal examiners and expertly trained uh, CPD presenters. So we pride ourselves on the quality of CPD events that we, that we run, and we feel that that is another strong reason uh, for taking the EDUCAS GCSE qualification. Uh, we also provide personal and friendly support uh, from subject experts. This can be done, or communication takes place in a number of different ways, usually uh, phone calls, more often than not email, and also face-to-face -face meetings with uh, principal examiners. I think we'll probably come back to this later on, but I, it's a very, very important part of our support mechanism that you can get direct contact with and very swift contact with subject experts, including uh, the subject officer and the subject support officer. The last thing I'd like to talk about in relation to why you should choose uh, EDUCAS GCSE 91 history is that the specification and sample assessment materials have been designed by teachers for teachers. All of the people who worked in the development process are teachers, have extensive experience of teaching, and certainly that was uppermost in their thinking in designing and constructing the specification for EDUCAS. We feel that is an extremely strong selling point uh, and another reason why you should choose EDUCAS 91 history. I'd like to talk to you about the key features of the 91 specification, in particular the qualification structure. Uh, I may have touched upon these points already, but we think that one of the key selling points and one of the key strengths of our specification is the clarity of structure and ease of access for teachers. The specification is laid out in such a way that teachers will find it easy to navigate their way through the specification and as I said we think that that is one of the key features and a key strengths of our qualification structure. 
In terms of questions, we've developed SAMs that we think enable learners to demonstrate what they know, understand and can do. That has been the principal driving force behind the development of the SAMs, the sample assessment materials. We have designed questions that will allow candidates to demonstrate what they can do. We have not designed qualifications and not designed sample assessment materials to catch students out. And again, we think that that is one of the key features of our qualification. And I have already talked about this point, but I would like to emphasise the point that in developing the SAMs, we have catered for the whole ability range. Uh, so that there is something in the SAMs, there's something in the specification for students of all abilities. In terms of uh, qualification support, we have a very, very experienced uh, team of senior examiners, principal examiners, and also chair of examiners. All of our principal examiners have extensive examining experience. Uh, many of them have been examining for 20 years or more. They are also teachers, and this point was emphasised before, and have extensive experience of practising as teachers and therefore have a feel for what students can do. Um, at least one of our principal examiners has 37 years teaching experience as well as 20 years examining experience, and we feel that that brings a gravitas and a certain quality to the whole process. You have direct access to subject experts via email, telephone. We pride ourselves on our ability to provide very swift feedback to all inquiries and direct access to the subject officer and subject support officer is one of our key strengths. Therefore, I would emphasize the accessibility of support that EDUCAS offers for this specification. Uh, we run face-to-face -face CPD continuous professional development uh, events. The full program for these can be found on our website. We also develop our own on extensive online resources for teachers and learners. I'm now going to take you through the detailed breakdown of the specification. As you are no doubt aware, DfE content stipulates that students in England following GCSE history uh, specifications must study two depth studies or studies in depth. One of these must be British and one of these must be non-British. Students will also have to study a period study of not less than 50 years, a thematic study covering three historical eras, and in addition to those points, study of an historic site. We've interpreted this uh, in, in the following way. We've divided those content elements into two components. Component one deals with studies in depth. This will involve a written examination of two hours divided into two papers. One paper will focus on a British study in depth and will have five questions. The other paper of one hour will focus on non-British study in depth, again covering five questions. This component makes up 50% of the qualification and I'll provide you with more details of the options in the next part of the discussion. The second main part of our specification is component two. Component two is entitled Studies in Breadth. Component two studies uh, covers the requirement to study a period and a thematic study, and in our specification, it also covers the historic site. This component is again broken into, covers two hours of examination, broken into two papers. Unlike uh, component one, the timing of the papers is slightly different. The period study paper lasts 45 minutes and has five questions. The thematic study paper is one hour and 15 minutes and has seven questions. The reason for the greater length of time for this paper, i.e. the thematic study paper, is that this paper con contains questions on the historic site. The historic site, uh, according to the DfE content, 
stipulates that it must be at least 10% of the qualification, and hence the greater time given to the thematic papers. Collectively, this makes up 50% of the qualification. So component one, studies in depth, is 50% of the qualification. Component two, studies in breadth, is 50% of the qualification. And I think this illustrates uh, the ease of navigation through the qualification. Component one is studies in depth. So in this component, students will look at shorter periods in history, but those shorter periods will be studied in greater depth. There are eight options in total in component one, but this is divided into four options uh, for the British study in depth and four options for the non-British study in depth. Centres will choose one British study in depth to study and one non-British study in depth to study. So really, from a total of eight options, centres will choose two. The crucial point, and this is a very, very important point, is that each study in depth must come from different historical eras. Uh, these historical eras are defined by DfE as medieval 500 to 1500, early modern 1450 to 1750, and modern 1700 to the present day. I think this is a really, really important point. There are checks and balances in place in the specification to ensure that centres don't opt for the wrong combination of options. But I think from the outset, it's really important to, to remember that whichever studies in depth you choose from, they must come from his different historical eras. Component two deals with studies in breadth. And so the whole purpose of this component is to study history over a long sweep, to look at longer periods of history and to provide that balance in terms of uh, student study of the subject. There are eight studies in breadth in total, but again this is divided between the period study and the thematic study. There are four period studies. Centres will choose one period study from a total of four options. There are four thematic studies, and again, centres will choose one thematic study from a total of four options. Crucially, and this is a very, very important point, EDUCAS has incorporated the study of an historic site into the study of the thematic, uh, thematic study. So it's really important to emphasise the point that when your students look at historic site, it sits in the context of this study of your chosen theme. In terms of component one options, uh, we've used an asterisk to reinforce the point about choosing uh, options from different historical eras. So one asterisk refers to the, med uh, refers to the medieval period, two asterisks refers to the early modern period, and where you have three, it refers to the modern period. So that hopefully will guide you um, carefully through your choice of options. As you can see, there are four options, 1A to 1D, for the British study in depth. You will choose one of these for your centre. We think that there is a good choice of options. We think that these are very interesting and very historically rich options, and they provide you with a very, very broad historical, uh, broad historical spectrum. We also um, have a degree of familiarity here in terms of some of the options offered. So austerity, affluence and discontent will be familiar to many centres. So too will Elizabethan age. But in the true spirit of the reform and the qualification, we've included new options which cover medieval history and an additional modern period. Uh, that is 1C, Empire, Reform and War, Britain, 1890 to 1918. 1A provides a medieval option, conflict upheaval, England, 1337 to 1381. And this, of course, will cover uh, issues like the Black Death and the Peasants' Revolt.
So we think that Component 1 offers uh, a rich choice, a rich historical choice for you and your students. Component 1 also contains uh, four options of non-British history. Uh, we have four non-British studies in depth. We feel that this provides a very rich range of options. There would be familiarity for many centres, particularly in two options, 1G, Germany in Transition, 1919 to 1939, and 1H, the USA, a Nation of Contrasts, 1910 to 1929. I should point out that in relation to Germany and transition, the time frame has been taken back to 1939. And clearly this was a deliberate uh, choice to make that very interesting option a more manageable option both for centres and for, and for candidates and for students. We have a range in terms of historical eras. So again, in the spirit of the reform, we have a medieval option, the Crusades, circa 1095 to 1149. Uh, Voyages of Discovery and Conquest of the Americas, option 1F. And those two options not only fulfill the spirit of the qualification, but also provide new and very, very interesting, very attractive options for you and your candidates, your students. Page 34 of the specification provides a full list of permitted combinations. Uh, and that should prevent, or will prevent, centres choosing the wrong combination of options. So I'd emphasise that point. Page 34 of the specification provides a full list of permitted combinations. Component 2 options provide opportunities for uh, students, learners, to cover history over a longer period in time. We have two elements to component two. First of all, the period studies. And again, we have four period studies on offer. Um, centers should choose one period study from the four that we, that we offer. Again, familiarity is uh, a word that you would use for some of those options, particularly 2A and 2B. Development of the USA, 1929 to 2000 and 2B, the development of Germany, 1919 to 1991. We also have new options and very attractive options uh, covering a longer period in Russian history, 20th century Russian history, essentially from um, the end of NEP through to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And we also have a very interesting option on the development of the UK, 1919 to 1990. So component two is made up of four period studies. Um, it also has four thematic studies, and those thematic studies cover history over a long, long period in time. So they cover a very broad sweep of history. Centers should choose one thematic study from, um, from four options. These thematic studies will be familiar again to many centres, particularly crime and punishment and changes in health and medicine. It's important to point out that these thematic studies are British-based, and through a combination of studying these thematic studies and the British study in depth, all centres fulfil the requirement to study 40% British history. So by studying these, you're fulfilling that requirement. We have two new uh, thematic studies, 2G and 2H, which we think are very attractive. Development warfare is a new option, and that will, will be a very, very attractive option covering uh, issues like the role of women in warfare, changes in technology in warfare, the causes of war, uh, and so forth. We also feel that changes in entertainment and leisure in Britain, circa 500 to the present day, will be a very attractive option for many, many, many centres. This covers a great deal of material looking at changes in sport, changes in leisure time, uh, changes in theatre, changes in cinema, and so on and so forth. So we hope that that will prove to be a very, very interesting option. So centres will have to take one thematic study or opt for one thematic study.
And that time frame, circa 500, the present day, is very, very important because it emphasizes the point that this covers three historical eras. Importantly, the requirement to study an historic site is part of the thematic study. We put the uh, requirement to study historic site into the thematic study because we feel it's an opportunity for students, candidates, to look at change over time and the way in which an historic site changes over time and the way in which that reveals changes in the thematic area that you're studying. Our historic site works on this basis. Each thematic study has a nominated historic site. For example, Crime and Punishment will nominate Botany Bay as an historic site. Health and Medicine nominates uh, the village of Eme during the Great Plague as an historic site, and so on. That historic site will run for two years. So for the first award and the second award, you will study one historic site, nominated historic site. Then the historic site will change for the next two-year cycle. And again, that second historical site linked to the thematic option is nominated in the specification. In terms of assessment, the historic site is assessed in the thematic papers. And question 6a and question 6b will always focus on the nominated historic site. We've decided to call it historic site for, for reasons of clarity. As I say, each historic, historic site is nominated in the specification. I should add one final point about uh, combinations. As I said, we have a full list of permitted com uh, combinations on page 34 onwards of the specification. There are, however, three clear prohibited combina combinations. These prohibited combinations are 1D and 2D, and those are the British uh, base studies. Austerity, affluence and discontent and development of the UK, 1919 to 1990. Also prohibited is 1G and 2B, and that is Germany in transition and the development of Germany. Uh, a further prohibited combination is 1H and 2A, and that is USA, nation of contrasts, and the development of the USA. So in very simple terms, centres will not be able to op opt for two British studies uh, from component 1 and component 2, two G German studies from Component 1 and Component 2, and two USA studies from Component 1 and Component 2. This, again, is made very clear in the specification, in the preamble to all of those options. I'm going to say a word about assessment objectives um, in this uh, next section of the, the discussion. DFE, Ofqual, lay down very precise weightings for each of the assessment objectives. For GCSE history, we have four assessment objectives, AO1, 2, AO4. AO1 is knowledge and understanding. AO2 is explanation and analysis. AO3 deals with source evaluation and source analysis. And AO4 deals with interpretations in history. So the weightings uh, are laid down or were laid down by DFE Ofqual, and you can see in the slide that the weightings are 35% for AO1, 35% for AO2, 15% for AO3, and 15% for AO4. What you then see in the slide are allocation of those assessment objectives, our interpretation of how to apply those assessment objectives. I think an important point to, to note is that the requirement to test interpretations in history is concentrated uh, entirely in Component 1. So in the two papers that you have in Component 1, the British DEP uh, paper and the non-British DEP paper, you will have a, a number of interpretation questions. And all of the testing of interpretations in this qualification will take place in Component 1. You'll also note from the uh, 
the weighting given to the, the different assessment objectives, that nearly all of the source analysis and source evaluation questions are located again in component one. There is an opportunity to deal with source sources and source evaluation in component two. But that is simply uh, an opportunity to apply skills developed in component one in one specific question in component two in the thematic paper. So in terms of accessibility, in terms of ease of navigation and dealing with the specification, I think it's important that both teachers and learners recognize that skills to do with source evaluation, source analysis, and discussion of inter interpretations is located in or principally in component one. Component two focuses mainly on AO1 and AO2 and therefore looks at causation, looks at change and continuity, similarity and difference over longer uh, periods in history. The way in which we've allocated the assessment objectives, I think, makes it easy to recognise which skills learners will have to apply in which set of examination papers. So as, as I say, component one focuses largely, albeit, albeit not exclusively, on source evaluation and discussion of interpretations. Component two focuses largely, although not exclusively, on uh, dis on change, continuity, similarity and difference, cause, consequence, significance, and those kind of issues. And again, we feel that this makes the qualification very, very clearly structured and very easy to navigate both for teachers and for learners. One key point I think I should point out in relation to component one and discussion of sources and interpretations is the very, very, very clear definition that both we and uh, DfE Ofqual place on sources and interpretations. Uh, our definition of a source is something from the period being studied. So a source will be contemporary to the period. The definition of interpretation is that it's a deliberate later construct. So it has to come from a later period. And that definition is applied very, very rigorously throughout the sample assessment materials. So from a teaching point of view and from a learner point of view, it's really important to recognize that those are the definitions that are used in relation to source and interpretation work. Uh, in terms of the key features of the specification, I'm now going to talk about the layout of the specification and the layout of each of the options on offer, both the component one and component two. The slide that you, you're looking at uh, gives you one example of the way in which we've laid out uh, each of the options in the specification. We feel that the layout of the specification for each of the options is very, very attractive. As you can see, we've uh, condensed all of the options into one page. Every option is divided into seven key bullet points, seven key questions, making it very, very accessible both for teachers and students. In terms of showing uh, your learners what the option is about, this layout makes it very, very, very accessible. The relationship between the layout of the spec and the sample assessment materials is very, very important. In terms of each of the sample assessment materials, we will focus questions on a number of those key questions. So if I take you through it um, as systematically as I possibly can. For the British Depth Studies, we have five questions and those five questions will focus on five of the areas or five of the key questions in the specification. So for example, the, the one that you've got in front of you is Austerity, Affluence and Discontent, Britain, 1951 to 1979. The SAMs focus on five of those key questions. The key point, however, is that there is no predictability here at all. The questions will focus on five of those areas 
meaning that two of the errors will be left out in each examination series. Furthermore, the order in which those questions appear will be entirely random. So this mitigates against predictability completely. You'll see that the layout of specification for each of the options revolves around those seven key questions. The required content has been made as manageable as we possibly can. Uh, it is important to point out that when it says required content, that's a clear indication to teachers and learners that all of those things uh, outlined in each part of the specification or each option are required learning. You have to cover those areas. As I said, the order in which these appear in the SAMs will be completely random and that will apply throughout the qualification. The British uh, depth study I've mentioned, the same applies to the non-British depth study. There are five questions. Those five questions will focus on five of the uh, key questions outlined in the specification and they will appear in random order. Same applies to the period study. Five questions, the five questions focusing on five key questions. Two will be left out and they will appear in entirely random order. The layout of the thematic options is slightly different in the sense that you have six key questions and the seventh area of the or seventh part of that specification focuses on the historic site. And the key difference between the thematic paper and the thematic study and the other options is that the thematic paper will cover all seven areas in the specification. But again, it'll be done in completely random order. We've given you the example of austerity, affluence and discontent, Britain 1951 to 1979. But to reiterate the point, the layout for every single option mirrors this one exactly. Clearly the content is different, the focus is different, but the layout is exactly the same. I'm now going to talk about uh, the sample assessment materials, which we refer to as the SAMs. We've given you one example from the 200 plus pages of SAMs that we developed. And this is question four from um, Austerity, Affluence, Discontent, um, the option or one of the options in the British uh, study in depth. A number of things should be made clear about this. You can see that it says question four. And clearly, this question focuses on immigration, which is one of the key points, one of the key questions in that option, in that part of the specification. But it's important to note that the question will not say which area this question is testing. So question four simply says question four. It doesn't say question four. This question is focused on immigration. And that, again, will uh, increase uh, unpredictability. So this question focuses on immigration. Uh, we have tried to be innovative in terms of the types of questions that we've designed. This, we feel, is a new type of question. And this question, we hope, will be attractive to both uh, teachers and learners. Without going into this in too much detail, candidates will be asked to make connections between two of the four given points. And the emphasis in rewarding candidates will be on the quality of their response in terms of uh, not only pointing out what those connections are, but also explaining the connections between the two points that they've chosen. So this is an example of the kind of questions that we've developed. In terms of the SAMs as a whole, the full set of SAMs are to be found on the history qualification page. I'd also add that on the history qualification page, we have uh, a number of presentations which were given at CPD which go through every question in detail, providing very detailed guidance on what the question is about and our advice to um, learners on how to approach those questions. I'm going to talk to you about endorsed textbooks. 
uh, in the next part of the discussion. Um, we appreciate the importance of resourcing the qualification um, as fully as we possibly can. We have a number of endorsed textbooks, and those are published by Hodder Education. These endorsed textbooks will cover Elizabethan age, 1558 to 1603, Germany in transition, 1919 to 1939, the development of the USA, 1929 to 2000, and changes in health and medicine in Britain, circa 500 to the present day. We feel that these will be a very, very important uh, resource for uh, teachers and learners. And we're delighted that Hodder has produced these textbooks uh, to support the, uh, the introduction of this specification. In addition to the Hodder education resources, we have existing resources on the Digital Resources website for option 1D, Austerity, Affluence and Discontent, Britain 1951 to 1979, and option 2B, The Development of Germany 1919 to 1991. We have produced resources for 1A, Conflict and Upheaval, England 1337 to 1381, and option 1B, The Elizabethan Age 1558 to 1603. For the non-British uh, study in depths, we have produced resources for 1E, the Crusades, circa 1095 to 1149, and 1F, the Voyages of Discovery and Conquest of the Americas, 1492 to 1522. These can be found on the Digital Resources website. All of those resources for uh, the, the studies in depth, component 1, produced by us, have been written by the principal examiner for those papers. In relation to uh, the studies in breadth, we have developed a resource for 2D, the development of the UK, 1919 to 1990, and we have also developed uh, resources for 2G, warfare in Britain, circa 500 to the present day, and 2H, entertainment and leisure in Britain, circa 500 to the present day. And in exactly the same way, the principal examiner for those papers uh, has written those resources. Combining both the Hodder education resources and our own digital resources, we feel that we've covered the specification as fully as we possibly can. We will also be looking into resourcing the historic site. And for many of those options, or certainly for the thematic study options, we will pay attention to uh, providing good resources for the study of this, the nominated historic, historic site. In addition to the resources that I've talked about, we also have some really, really useful resources for teachers. The first of these is Online Exam Review, or OER. Clearly, this is something for the future, but OER essentially provides examination responses which have been marked and annotated by principal examiners. And in the future, this will provide a very, very detailed insight into the standard required for the specification in all its different assessments, in all its different component parts. So the online exam review is a very, very important tool for looking at candidate performance, for looking at the qualities of responses, for gaining an insight into how those responses are marked, and also an insight into principal examiner thinking on the quality of the response. And for all teachers, that is an invaluable assessment for learning tool. Uh, so OER is a very, very important part of the re resource that, that we offer as EDUCAS. We also provide exam results analysis, or ERA, and this facility allows teachers to compare the performance of individual students and the centre's entry as a whole with that of all EDUCAS candidates for a particular qualification. CPD training courses have already been uh, discussed 
in this, uh, this presentation, but to reinforce the point that we do offer face-to-face -face CPD courses. And those CPD courses are run by expert principal examiners who provide a very, very detailed insight into the qualification, into the specification, and the assessment of that qualification. We have a full program of CPD events planned. All forthcoming CPD events will be available uh, via the EDUCAS website. It's also important to note that a uh, subject officer will be at the CPD events in order to provide uh, direct access to teachers and various questions they might want to ask about the qualification. If you require further information, details are provided on the website and please contact the subject officer Dylan Jones directly or the subject support officer Greg Lewis. I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much for listening to this and we look forward to working with you in the future.